For those of you that don't know this, um, and I don't expect you to know my schedule, but Thursdays are really, really busy. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a crunch day, if you will. You know, you've got to make sure that everything's put together, that all the finishing touches are in place, and that everything is ready for Sunday. Um, now, I would say this. It's probably one of the most busy days of the week for me. You know how deadlines are. And um, this last Thursday, I left my cell phone uh, on the little stand by my bed. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but you see, I go nowhere without my cell phone. I always have my cell phone with me. You know, what if I need somebody, or what if somebody needs me, or what's, you know, what, uh, anything can happen, right? So I always have my cell phone with me. And um, I got into the office at 7 o'clock on Thursday because I wanted to get a jump start on this morning's sermon. And uh, got in, and I said, I'm going to beat everybody in the office, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to finish this sermon. This, uh, it's going to be a humdinger. I don't know if y'all know what a humdinger is, but that's a uh, South Mississippi term. And uh, I got in at 7, and I was realizing that I didn't have my cell phone with me. Maybe it was a little bit of a blessing because I finished the sermon, uh, but you, you never know when things like that. But it was kind of a helpless feeling. I had lost the ability to communicate with the outside world. And I feel like sometimes, and I know you feel this way, that there is a communication breakdown between us and the Father, and it's kind of a scary situation. It's kind of a, a helpless feeling. I'm glad to be able to tell you today, on the authority of God's Word, that God is always a prayer away, that we can always go to Him in prayer. As a matter of fact, we have a prayer room that's set aside just for that one purpose. If you've never spent any time in there, I encourage you to come up some, sometime during the week and spend some time in prayer. Uh, it's a great place, very warm and, and, and uh, very, very cozy, but it's a good place to spend time with the Father. From a Roman imprisonment, the Apostle Paul corresponded with the church at Philippi. And this is a largely positive epistle. It's one of my favorites. And it gives readers a vast amount of doctrinal truth. Uh, we're going to see that communication with the Father is paramount and that a thankful heart goes a long way. So I want to invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7. After you find your place in your copy of God's Word, I'd like to invite you to stand to honor and to reverence the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Philippians chapter 4, let's look in verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this text. I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you for the privilege of prayer. Father, I know that I can't preach this sermon without you. I'm totally dependent on you. And so, Father, I pray that as we would stop everything in our minds and our hearts for, for these moments, I pray that you'll give us a focus on your word, that we may not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. I pray for your anointing in this time to proclaim your truths, and I pray that you'll guide us. And when the time of decision comes, I pray that people will respond because they've heard the call that you've placed forward. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I talked to the praise team earlier, and I said, I just feel like today God wants to do something. And so before I get into the sermon, I just want to throw that out there. Sometimes you just feel like God's ready to do something. And I told them, I said, it's going to start with us. And today, I believe God wants to do something. The first thing I'd like to talk to you about is having a prayerful heart and mind. A prayerful heart and mind. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Dr. Warren Wearsby said that the word prayer is the general word for making a request known to God. 
it carries the idea of adoration and devotion and worship. Whenever we find ourselves worrying, our first action ought to be to get along with God and to worship Him. I don't know about you, but when I get worried, and by the way, I wrote this before I knew everything was happening with, with Madeline. Um, so I'm responsible for doing what I tell you to do. It's kind of the way it works. Be, be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication. Folks, the power is in the prayer. And if I could get the church to understand something this morning, that if we really are going to be powerful for the Lord, if we're going to be a powerful testimony unto God, and we're really going to make a difference in this community, and we're really going to shine for Him, I believe it has to start with prayer. You see, that's the power source. I, uh, I have a cell phone, and when you're sitting up in the hospital... You know, you're sending out all these texts and, and uh, everybody wants to know about things and all that. It drains the battery down. And I had to call mom and ask her. I said, I need you to get a couple of things together for us. And she said, okay, what do you want? One of the first things I said was my phone charger because unless I plugged it into the power source, that phone does me no good. And it's the same thing with us. Church, unless we get back to a mode of prayer and we plug into the power source, which is the Holy Spirit of God, we are going to be absolutely useless. We have got to get to being a praying church. I have the vision and I have the desire to see this happen. I would love it if people stopped by all through the course of a week and said, look, I was out, I went by Dollar General, uh, right down the road, I just wanted to stop in for five minutes and, and pray in the prayer room. What if that prayer room became a central focus of this campus, and as opposed to looking at everything else, what if we spent time working diligently in that prayer room? That should be a sacred place for us. That should be a holy place for us, if you will, and that God would be found there, that we would hit our knees if, if, if you're able to, and we would focus on prayer and focus on adoring the Father and plugging into the power source. I don't know about you, but I need my batteries charged up all during the week. I don't want to go one day without prayer. I need the Father. I need to feel His presence. I need to know that He's right there. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's just good to sit there and say, Hey, Daddy, I don't want to say anything. I just need to know you're here. Tobe, just a minute ago, come and, and, and talk with Toby, my, my youngest son. And he just came in and sat right here by me. You see, there's something about being with your dad that gives you a bit of peace and comfort, right? And so many people are sitting in the church pews week in and week out and have no peace whatsoever. And I'm telling you, you've got to plug in to the Father. You've got to be a person of prayer. Let's look at some verses on prayer. We need a prayerful heart and mind. Matthew chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 says this, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Now I don't know about you, but that helps my heart to know that God before I ever approach his, th his throne of mercy and grace, he already knows what I need. And some people have told me before, pastors said, I I'd love to be able to pray like so-and-so, but I don't know how. I don't know how to use the words, or I'm not eloquent. I'm not an elegant prayer. Look, you don't have to be. You just open your heart and open, uh, open your mouth and allow God to hear what's on your mind. And allow God to hear your thanksgiving, which we're about to talk about. But know this, when you approach Him, He already knows what's on your mind. He already knows. The Scripture tells us that He even knows the count of the hairs on our head. The Father loves you. He tells us this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What shall ye eat, or what ye shall drink, or nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on? 
Is not your life more than meat and your body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor they gather uh, into barns. Yet therefore your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? In other words, you think you're going to get taller by worrying a lot? But we worry, don't we? Or I do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. We should be in a constant communication with the Father. It should just be a natural thing for us to walk and prayerfully uh, approach the Father throughout the day. But there's a, a second part to it that I'd like to talk to you about, and it's having a thankful heart and mind. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. You see, a lot of people, when they quote this particular verse, they like the prayer and the supplication part, but they forget about the thanksgiving part. If there is a group of people on this earth that should be thankful, it should be the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thanksgiving should not just be something that happens one time out of the year. Thanksgiving should be an everyday thing for believers. Matter of fact, I'm going to go this far with it. Before you get into your requests and everything else, just stop and thank God for how good He's been in your life and see if it doesn't change your whole attitude. It will change everything about your whole day. Stop and thank God for how good He's been. Stop and just meditate on how good He's been. Uh, stop and place into your heart and into your mind that God has been so faithful. God has seen you through and He will continue to see you through and be a thankful person because of it. Thanksgiving hones in our emotions and our minds toward the correct attitude when approaching the Father. I think we should have a thankful attitude. And sometimes people uh, get angry with God because they didn't get their way. So let me stop and deal with that just a second if I will. Understand this. God already knows in your life what is best all the way around. Okay, that's hard. But if we really believe in the sovereignty of God and we really trust in the Lord and lean not upon our own understanding, we have to be a thankful people and accept the fact that His ways are higher than our ways and, and God just knows better for us. But when the hard things come, when the hard storms are there, when the hard winds are blowing, when it, it, it's difficult and tears are being shed, it's hard to be thankful. But I would like to challenge you, church, that's the time you need to be the most grateful because God is constantly working on your behalf, as Romans 8.28 says. God is consistently on your behalf working. And not only is He working on your behalf, the Scripture tells us the Lord Jesus Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. Romans tells us that the Holy Spirit is making groans for us groanings for us that we can't even understand. He's doing it on our behalf because sometimes we don't even know how to pray, right? God is consistently and constantly working on your behalf all things together for the good of those who love Him to those that are called according to His purpose. God knows what He's doing. Allow Him to be God. He's sovereign. He's on the throne. God doesn't have emergency meetings in heaven. And by the way, as much as it maybe even offends us a little bit. God doesn't need our advice, does He? He knows what He's doing. You see, it's hard for us because we think we know what's best. But the whole time, God has our best interests at heart. Sometimes I make decisions for my children that they can't make because they don't see the outcome that I see. And in the same way, God knows what's best for us. And I know that our minds say, well, what about this situation? What about this circumstance? Or what? Look, there's a point where you, you just may not know the truth this side of glory. But that's where your trust comes in to the Father. And be a thankful person. Do you remember in Luke 17 the story of the uh, ten lepers? Do you remember that as they were going away that one 
turned around out of the ten and praised God? One out of ten. I do not want to have a church that one out of ten of us is thankful to the Lord. I want all of us to be thankful to the Lord. I want to see a place of praise and worship and adoration of the Father where we come together and we say, I know God's been good to me this week. I could tell you about it if I had the pulpit. I could tell you about it if I had the microphone. I could tell you about it if, if, if we sit down and talked over a cup of coffee. I could tell you how good God's been to me if you just gave me a little bit of time. What if we as a church family were a thankful group of people as opposed to focusing on all the negative that's out there? I'm telling you, in Jesus' name, leave all the negative out there and let's be a thankful people. That will unify the church. Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 4.2 says this, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. We need to be a thankful group of people. My third point is we need to be a, uh, have a peaceful heart and mind. You say, I've been looking for peace. Pastor, I, I want to hear about this. I want to hear about how to have a peaceful heart and mind. The scripture says in our text today, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, here it is, which passeth all understanding. Have you ever thought about what that means? To pass all understanding? It means this. It means to transcend or to excel all human understanding. In other words, God will blow your mind at the peace that he will give you to walk through the valley or to walk through the good. God will just absolutely take your hand and it will be amazing to you what God is doing in your life. You know, we, uh, we as people look for peace in all the wrong places sometimes. One lady was asked about peace and she said, I know it's going to be a good day when all the wheels on my shopping cart turn the same way. You know, we look for peace in all the wrong places sometimes. Some of you came here today, and in your heart and in your mind, as I'm talking about it today, you're at unrest. Matter of fact, for some of you, it is difficult to even tune into the sermon because you've got so many things on your mind. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding. I can tell you about this peace because I've experienced it firsthand. This peace doesn't come from the world. This peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul is writing this, understand most likely he was chained to a Roman official. He was literally most likely chained uh, and in prison for preaching the gospel. And he's writing, telling the church at Philippi how they're supposed to have peace. I don't know about you, but that resonates with me. If I'm in jail, I'm scared to death. I'm biting my fingernails off. And here Paul is, he's writing to us about having peace. And he's in jail. Romans 5.1 says it like this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a couple of things about that verse that's very important. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That shows possession. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord. It is a personal relationship that began when he called me unto salvation. And before the world was ever formed, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm going, I'm, going to make, I'm going to pay the penalty for Josh's sin. And I placed my faith in Christ. I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. And at that moment, he sealed me with the Holy Spirit of promise. He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life, and I've never been the same. And I have peace that I don't know when my time is going to come or when the Lord is going to call. I don't know when that's going to be. But I have peace set aside in my heart that passeth all understanding and it keeps my mind and my heart focused on heaven because I know the Lord Jesus Christ has got my soul taken care of. And so I can't explain when my time's going to be up, but I can explain where I'm going to go with all the surety. 
I don't have to ask Oprah. I don't have to look at the Vanity Fair. I don't have to go to the Rolling Stones. I don't have to go to anywhere else. I know where I'm going because Jesus told me I'm going to give you peace. And I know people are scared to death to walk down in, in front of a church. I get that. But I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus today, when we have our time of decision, wave at me. I'll come and walk with you. I'll do what i got to do to get you down here and to talk to you about how good my Lord is. You see, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. He's already done the work. You've just got to place your faith in him, and he'll save you. And what happens is he gives you a peace that passeth all understanding. The Life Application Commentary said worrying is bad. Did you know that worry is bad? It says this, worrying is bad because it is a subtle form of distrust in God. It went on to say this, that prayer combats worry. Now, I don't know about you, but this is where I need to tune in to the sermon a little bit. Okay, I get this. I get that worry is not good for me. It keeps me awake at night. But I don't know what to do about it. Let me tell you what to do in your worry. This is the how-to part. You pray. You commune with the Father. You spend time with the Father. You thank the Father for what He's done. And you allow his peace to fall over you. And if you will sit and you'll meditate and you'll open his word and, and get into his word, that peace will transcend your understanding. And God will give you peace to make it through that trial or that hard time. Some of you, and I love to hear the stories, some of you have walked through that valley before and you've sit there with your Bible open and you just sit there and pray so you know what I'm talking about. I had a coffee meeting and to, to, to keep from embarrassing anybody it's with somebody that's in this room and I would dare not embarrass anybody on purpose but I had a coffee meeting and we were talking about ministry because uh, uh, she has been involved in ministry for a number of years and she encouraged my heart. I called her to encourage her but she encouraged me because she was telling me about how she made it. How her husband, being a minister, made it over and over and over again. And I said, lady, you just encouraged me, and I was trying to encourage you. But that story, those stories touched my life to hear that God is faithful and that God works and that God is going to work on my behalf even when I don't see how it's going to happen, that God is faithful. And if I place my trust in God, that he's going to pull me through. Now, this gets me to my... Uh, to my point where I want to talk to you about Daniel for a minute. You remember that they signed, uh, uh, even put it in writing, that nobody's going to pray unless, uh, unless they, they pray to the king. You're going to have to pray to him. And Daniel said, no, I'm not going to do this. He knew that it was written. This is in Daniel 6. And he goes up into his chamber, and he opens the window toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees. And three times a day, it says, he prayed. But it also says, if you've missed it, it also says that he gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So he stepped up his game. Not only did he go to the Lord in prayer, when things got bad, he got on his knees not one time a day. He said, I'm going to make it three times a day and see what happens. I'm going to open up my window. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to pray and I'm going to thank God. I'm going to see things happen because God told me he would work on my behalf and he trusted God. And what happened when he got in the tough situation, when he got down there with the lions, you remember what God did? God sent something to, uh, called an angel to shut their mouth, and those hungry lions didn't touch him. I don't even think they sniffed him good. And what happened was Daniel was on his knees in prayer, and God answered his prayer. And I'm telling you, you are serving the same God that Daniel of old was serving. You are serving the same God that Paul in prison is, was serving. You are serving the same God that I'm talking to you about. People say, I'd love to have faith like the pastor. You've got the same faith. 
It's the same God. Just place your faith in Him. Get on your knees with thanksgiving. Let these requests be made known unto God. And God will give you this peace that you're longing for in your life. Is it always going to be easy? He always makes a way. Now, I want to get to the last part of this because this last part, I have to get out of my system good. I've got about five minutes left, and if you'll hang in there with me, I'm going to explain something to you that will blow your mind. It says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep. It shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, I want to talk to you about that word keep for a second. That word keep is actually a military term in the Greek. And it literally means to guard, but it's the concept of a military uh, fortress that is built around a city. And the concept is that this peace that God gives you will encamp around your mind and give you this peace that, you're, that we're talking about that you're needing so bad today. And God will send a military might of His angels, His Holy Spirit, to surround your mind and surround your heart and to keep you, which means to guard you. He will guard you through Christ Jesus. Now when I read that, I said, holy amen to that. That is wonderful. I need that because my mind worries. And God says, I'm going to set up camp around your mind and around your heart, and I'm going to guard you. Now, if Satan has truly been on the loose this last week, some of you know, I need something to guard my heart and my mind. And it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you know that when he speaks, things happen? And you need that around your mind and around your heart. And if you'll ask him, he'll do it. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, I told you part of the story about Thursday morning. I, uh, I have my iPad with me, and I'm getting too technical for some of you. I already see it. But I had my iPad with me, so I tried to get on Facebook and tried to contact Jennifer. Well, that didn't work. So I did what any rational human, would have, human being would have done to start with. I went and got the church office phone, and I called Jennifer. And she's a wonderful wife. If you haven't gotten the ability to know her yet, you're going to find that she's a wonderful, wonderful person. She's a wonderful helpmate. And uh, Jennifer said, what is it, baby? And I said, Jen, I, I walked off and I left my phone at home, and I need it. I got a busy day today. I got a lot of meetings. And you know what she did? She jumped in the vehicle. She said, I'll be right there. And she jumped in the vehicle, and she brought that phone to me. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. I only live about five minutes away. But see, the, the moral of it is, she did something for me that I could not do for myself. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. He did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. We could not pay the penalty for our sins. But you see, Jesus could pay it. And that's what he did. I still believe in preaching salvation. And I still believe that people that are sitting in the church pews week in and week out need to hear about the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ offers. And I'm telling you this, I don't care if it's your first time here or you've been here all your life. I don't care if you're 10 years old or 100 years old. If you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you today, he'll do it. That's the good news. We call it the gospel. And if you'll ask Jesus to save you, he'll do it today. 
There's not a thing in this world to be ashamed of. You see, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means me too. And I'm asking you today to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have a time of decision. We're going to have our musicians and, and our vocalists to come back up. And we're all going to stand and sing. And I'm telling you this, if you don't have the strength to walk down by yourself, if you, if you even just lift your hand, I'll come and walk with you. Or somebody be glad to walk with you. And let's get this peace that we've been longing for so long to blow our minds, to transcend all of our beliefs, and to allow it to keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But you have to want it, and you have to want it now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'll take that message and that you'll cleanse it from any error or any mistake that I could have made. And Father, I believe with all my heart that today somebody needs to be saved. I don't know who, Father. That's, that's for you to know. But I pray that you'll give them strength, Father, to, to come down and to accept you as Lord and Savior. And I'm asking you today, Father, for those that need peace, that are going to come down for prayer, I pray that you will give them your sweet peace and that they will leave here totally different than the way that they came because you've given them your peace. And I'm going to ask you to do it in the sweet and precious name of Jesus. Amen.